Endless Hustle is presented by Eat Clean Bro, a convenient solution to bring you the highest quality chef-prepared meals delivered right to your door. Eat Clean Bro is the contract-free solution for your meal prep needs. Made with all natural ingredients and next-day delivery, every meal feels like you have someone cooking for you right at home. All right, we got a little bit of combat sports flair on the Endless Hustle today, as I'm joined by one of the, actually, and I was telling your your marketing guy, Don, this, you're one of my favorite boxing commentators while you were still in boxing, when you were doing Showtime Boxing, Paulie Malinacci. Now you've moved over to Bare Knuckle Sports. I miss you at Showtime Boxing because I really like you there, but congrats on the Bare Knuckle stuff. You got a, a cool event coming up we're going to talk about, and you yeah. got the beard of beards you're rocking right now, so I'm jealous because yeah. I can't grow any one of those. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think as you age, you got to start uh, looking the part and uh, try to get yourself to look the best the way in the best way you can. So as my face aged, I felt like the beard, it, it, uh, it fit well. When I was younger, it didn't. Wait a minute. So – you were watching soccer. I'm going to call you out on the show right off the oh, it's my bat. Favorite you were supposed to be here 15 minutes ago and you were watching. What's this? Yeah, I'm the, that's my favorite sport, man. I mean, my, my family are off the boat Italians. So I grew up around soccer. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, my, favorite. it's my favorite sport. It's, I, I mean, I have other passions on the sports, but soccer, I'll watch a soccer game over anything else. Like a, a top level soccer. So, how does a kid from Brooklyn? who loves soccer, get into boxing. How did it all start for you? You kind of, you know, you start going off of a weird path, you know, you get yourself in trouble and boxing is really the only sport that it will kind of take you off of a negative path. You don't really have a, a situation in other sports where you come from a negative path and you can kind of get yourself on a straight path because those other sports are usually team sports and you've got to start them from when you're young. You know, you've got to start them when you're a kid, you know. Boxing is the only one that kind of gives you an, an angle where you can be going in the wrong direction and then, uh, and then uh, you know, you kind of just get into boxing and it sort of starts to straighten you out a little bit, you know. If I would have started playing, you know, other sports at, at the age I started boxing, uh, it, you know, guys already have their roster spots, you know, you, they've, been on, they've been on those roster spots, they're known and they're yeah. in those sports for years and, and on that local and regional level, you're not going to replace somebody on a roster that easily, you know, uh, so, so you're, you're, it, and it's hard to catch up. So boxing is kind of, you're just on your own, you know, you can try to catch up on your own, do the hard work, do the, do the, put the dedication and, and training, and then uh, you get to prove it in competition and one-on-one competition. So once you start doing that, you know, you essentially catch up. So it, by that point, the way my life had gone, it was, uh, it, it's not like I didn't like boxing. I liked boxing, but I didn't, I didn't expect it to become my living until, uh, until it became my living. So when do you realize you're good? Is it at a young age? Are you beating the shit out of people? Like, how does it all come together for you? I was 16 years old when I started, so I was behind everybody else, you know, because most kids are starting younger than that. But I started winning tournaments. Uh, I, you know, first I had to learn to box. And then I started competing in tournaments uh, about nine months into, into after learning to box, after starting boxing. And then um, from there, you know, you just got one tournament after another, after another. And little by little, you kind of start to realize, you know, you're getting good. You're, uh, you become a guy people are watching. You become a guy people are talking about. And uh, you start getting more and more results. And, um, you know, I knew I was in a very, very world-class gym. Gleason's gym in New York at the time was, you know, one of the best gyms in the world, not just in New York City. So, so I was competing in that gym, training in that gym, and I knew I was getting better and better. And then when I would go out and compete in my tournaments, you know, I was getting better and better results. So, so I knew, uh, I, I kind of started to realize there was something there. And then, you know, one thing leads to another. You know, people start to come at you or make, give you offers uh, to turn pro. And uh, before you know it, you realize you're a, you're a commodity. It's a bit, a bit sought after, and you can do something with this, you know. So that's how it went. So I'm so fascinated by all this. I don't know. If you've been watching, there's this docu-series called The Kings about the four great middleweights and welterweights, Sugar Ray Leonard, Marvin, of course, Tommy Hearns, and uh, Duran. I was like mm-hmm. blanking of all people to blank on Roberto Duran, but yeah, it just, just talked about their journey. What's this? He had his birthday yesterday. He just turned uh, I think it's 75 or 80, something like that. Something crazy, you know? Yeah, he's a personality. That dude is a personality, mm-hmm. but... It's amazing because you see all of their unique journeys and how they all got to the top. And it's fascinating to see how, like you said, boxing essentially saved their lives. 
but you also see the, the 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 flip side of the sport how you can be a commodity the dirtiness the promoters the money not getting it's it's so when you're going through all that how hard is it to really read what's on the up and up and what's not I mean, unless you have a good team around you, it's hard, you know, um, I didn't always have a, a great team around me, you just kind of learn and, you know, it's trial and error sometimes as far as who's good and who's not and what you're learning and you're learning as you're going along and then you start to realize, you know, what's what's better for you and what's a, what's a not so good choice for you, you know, so, so it was, um, you know, a lot of times, you know, these, especially a lot of boxers just come from the streets, you know, they don't know that corporate world, you know, boxing is essentially a corporate world once you reach a certain level, you know, so. So um, you've got to kind of be able to read, have your street instincts to read people. But now it's in a corporate world where you're not really used to reading these kind of people, you know. So um, sometimes you make the wrong mistakes, you know, and sometimes, you know, you, you end up in the wrong hands. And yes, you are always a commodity. But I don't think that 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 is just exclusive to boxing. I think any multi-million dollar business um, is always going to have greedy people in it. You know, uh, it's just human nature. The, the, the money attracts the snakes, right? Where there's money, the snakes are going to are gonna slither that way in that grass, right? So, so um, boxing is a, is a, a, very, a very lucrative uh, uh, business, you know, uh, as for, at the highest level, there's a lot of money there. So, so of course, you've got to uh, know what decisions to make because where there's a lot of money, there's also a lot of sneaky people. It's just human nature. One of the key learnings from that series is each one of those guys made it to the top. And they've obviously since become iconic, but each one of them, when they became champion or made it to the top, really screwed up their life. Whether it was the partying, the adultery, the drugs, each one of them had their own story. As someone who was a two division champion, what happens when you get to that point? When you win the championship, you've accomplished this lifelong goal. What is happening in your head and around you at that point? You start to get invited to the better parties. You start to get invited into VIP sections. You start to realize that you are uh, somebody that people look at when you walk in the room. And, uh, you know, people are talking about you when you walk in any room, you know. Um, you start to realize that, you know, a lot of rules maybe maybe not don't apply to you anymore, you know. Uh, things get a bit more flexible when you do something as opposed to when somebody else does something, you know. You start to realize that there's – you know, people look at you at, from a different standard than they look at everybody else. And sometimes that benefits you and sometimes that hurts you, you know. Um, it depends on how thick your skin is as well. But I think there's more pros than cons, if you could, but you just got to know how to be an adult and make a right decision, you know. At a certain point, you've got to ask yourself whether you did this to be a champion and, and be the best you can be, to leave a mark on the sport, to, to let people know you arrived, or if you did this just for the money, you know, or just for the fame, you know. So, so uh, I think uh, something like boxing, especially, it's a one-on-one -on -one sport. It's a combat sport. It has to be very personal and dear to you. It has, if it's not very personal and dear to you, and it's just about everything else, and it's all about the distractions, eventually that lack of a foundation will, will undo you, you know? But if it's personal and dear to you, I think um, regardless of the distractions, and they will present themselves, and sometimes they will get you and they will bite you, but well, if the distractions, you'll, you'll be able to rebound and... Uh, and, 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 and be a successful uh, uh, athlete and human being and, and, and person um, because, you know, character is based on self-accountability. And, and when you've got this kind of money, you still have to have that self-accountability, you know. There's some people that aren't, don't have the ability to make that kind of money one way, or in one reason or another. Some people, some people want it and don't want to put in the work. Some people put in the work and they don't have, just don't have the ability or talent. And some people get there and have all the talent and still find a way to ruin it in some way, somehow, by personal decisions that, that they make because of the way life drives them and, and the mechanism of the distractions and the deceptions that are there when you're at a high level and when you're among the VIP uh, people in life, right? And VIP parties in life. So, so there's a lot of, uh, things that can trip you up. It's just a matter of what's dear to you, what's important to you. I think when you, once you, as, as you get a little older, you start to, uh, kind of see, start to be able to see things from a perspective where you realize what's important and what's not, you know, in the beginning, you kind of don't, you know, plus you feel, you think you feel like you're going to live forever. You feel like you got all, you have all the time in the world to make, fix any mistake that happens. You know, when you're young, you just feel like, all right, it's all right. You know, we'll make a mistake here, but we'll fix it here. You know? And at a certain point, you realize, you know, that's like, it's a lot shorter than you think, you know, you don't want to make too many mistakes because there's, there's no coming back from some of them. So, so, uh, you know, that's kind of the things I learned, you know, and that's both from what my experiences and the experiences I saw other people going through. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned that because that was, and I'm using this docu-series as kind of a roadmap for what we're talking about, but it really showed you the life of 
four guys who truly live the blueprint of what it means to become a great boxer. And the other key point that they touched upon, and I wanted to talk to you about was hanging on too long. And we see it so many times with boxers where they fight past their expiration date. Obviously, the greatest example is Muhammad Ali. But each one of those guys, I mean, Duran was like 300 pounds, it looked like when he was fighting at the end. Do you know as a boxer, like, did you personally know? I mean, I know you you did the bare knuckle, but as a boxer, did you know it was over when it was over? Yeah, I, I mean, I did the bare knuckle because I knew it wouldn't be as hard on my body as, as professional boxing was, and it wasn't. I mean, a 10-minute fight at the end of the day is something anybody can get into if they're tough enough and have the ability, you know? So while bare knuckle boxing may look a lot m- more unsafe, I felt like it was safer and I felt like it was more conducive to me for the age that I was at. I was a little older and, uh, you know, your legs kind of prevent you from being in long, tough, dragged out fights because, you know, you don't have the same spring in them. But five two-minute rounds was what I fought, 10-minute fight. I said, you know what, for a 10-minute fight, this is not, <laughs> this is very, very easy when I'm used to fighting 12, three-minute rounds, you know? So, uh, you know, the, the psychology of it wasn't that difficult for me. But but I, I, I did know in my mind and heart that by that point, there was no way I could ever compete at a world-class level in boxing. The, the world-class level in boxing is, is a, a very, very difficult to navigate and very, very difficult to stay at, you know? And I kind of realized, you know, um, at a certain point that my reflexes weren't the same anymore. Um, the main streak I had wasn't the same anymore. Um, the, you know, you kind of just soften up a little bit as you get older. Um, I realized that, uh, I was more injury prone. I tried to work as hard as I used to, you know, without thinking twice about it, without thinking about my age. And yet if I worked that hard as I used to, I suddenly would find myself getting a little injury here or a little injury there that would affect my ability to train the way I wanted to train. So, so when those little things started happening, I realized, you know, this is uh, my body kind of letting me know that it's over, you know, there's things you can do, but, but, you know, if you're, if you're human, human beings age, you know, it's a, uh, it's a natural process, unfortunately. Except Tom Brady. Except Tom Brady. Who doesn't? <laughs> well, they, you know, even Tom Brady, I look at, uh, you know, he's a great quarterback. I think he might be the best ever. You know, I didn't always want to admit that because I was, uh, I felt like Montana was somebody that you couldn't compare to. But I feel like Brady, you know, has a, definitely a, 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 uh, is in the conversation and might just very well be the best ever. But I also think that had he lived in Montana's days, he wouldn't have been able to play as long. You know, Montana, had he lived in Brady's days, would have been able to play longer as well. And maybe they'd still, maybe they would have won just as many Super Bowls, you know? So, so you don't know, you know, uh, it, it's, uh, it, but what it is, is nonetheless, you know, you, you get smarter. Uh, every generation gets a little smarter and they learn a little bit more. But, um, you know, they, a lot of sports, boxing is not one of them, though. A lot of sports change rules for these athletes, you know, they make them safe, make it safer, you know, less physical, less demanding. So you start to see guys uh, playing into their older age. Box, there's no rules you can make in boxing that are like that. You know, you, the only thing you've seen really is is uh, the rounds going from 15 rounds to 12 rounds in the in the mid to late 80s. They 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 change the mandated mandates for the championship fights. But other than that, I mean, what are you going to tell a guy? You can't throw as many punches. You can't hit as hard. There's no rules you can make. So so you know, uh, the aging process is the aging process. I want to talk to you about the old neighborhood. You're a kid from Brooklyn. So when yeah. you make it, you win the championship, your first championship, what's the reception like at home? Are you like a national hero? Um, I got a lot of good, 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 good attention in, in my neighborhood, you know. Um, but I was also, you know, Italian neighborhoods are, are, are both, we're both lovable to each other and also very, uh, a, a lot of rivalry with each other, you know. So it was a little bit of a mix when I got home. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, you know, it just felt good that everybody knew I'd accomplished something, you know, um, it was cool. Um, I, I'm never going to bed my, my old neighborhood because Ben Center's when I grew up, I felt like, you know, it was the best place in the world. You know, it was a, a culture, a little, its own little nook and it's culture, uh, the Italian American neighborhood that really you rarely see anymore, if not at all, if, if at all, even in the whole country, you know, um, I had that, you know, and, 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 and I don't think words will ever describe it. You know, you just don't see it anymore. You don't have it anymore. Uh, the the worth and the self pride you had of people coming from the same background as you, uh, understanding each other's culture, understanding each other's ways of life, understanding each other's mechanism, understanding each other's way of speaking, understanding each other's way of thinking, and overcoming all these barriers 
just, just getting here and then to this country and then uh, you know having the opportunities to do things and, and, and making no excuses for ourselves and, and going and doing it you know and then uh, you know that's the way I was raised that's the way I was taught and you know it was uh, uh, it was that kind of neighborhood and, and, and I think it built the character in me even when I didn't want to have character even when I didn't want to listen you know um, there was a lot of people in that neighborhood that didn't make it out of that neighborhood as well you know like people always think about you know, minority neighborhoods. A lot of people in Italian neighborhoods didn't get out as well. Those days, I, one of my cousins was killed there, you know, uh, you know, in that street life too, you know. So so it was, uh, um, you know, it, it wasn't that easy. But you could easily get sucked up into something else as well, you know. But at the same time, character, uh, principles, uh, parameters, you know, those are things that we really were built into our minds. You know, whether you did it in the whether you apply them in your street life or you apply them in your, in your business life, whichever direction you are going to go to in life, you know, we were taught that parameters, principles, and, and character matters at most. Because if you want to succeed at any of the things you're going to go to, whether it's illegal stuff or legal stuff, you got to do it with character, principles, and morals and, uh, and parameters. Dude, I'm Russian and I have a ton of family and have how always had a ton of family in Bay Ridge and Bensonhurst. So oh. I always love... Dude, yeah. and Brighton. I mean, yeah. that whole Brighton, end of Brooklyn. Sheeps Sheeps that whole end of Brooklyn is what yeah. keeps at bay. Yeah. The, yeah. You got the mob, both Italian yeah. and Russian. The yeah. restaurants. Yeah. There's nothing like it's, it. It was a great time. It was a great time. You know, uh, it was a great time. People have people hear a lot of the stereotypes and and don't understand how you know they 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 get the wrong idea. It was a great time. There's still a lot of Russians in uh, Sheeps at Bay and stuff like that. I still see that. But oh, dude, and Brighton. Yeah. Yeah. The Italian area is pretty much gone, though. You know, it's uh, it's sad, but uh, I was glad I was able to experience it in in, uh, in, in my years growing up. So I started at the top of the interview, really complimenting you on your broadcasting skills, and honestly, you did a fantastic job. You could, you out, of, you did a great job with analysis. But what I really loved when you would broadcast is your enthusiasm, because you were an action fighter yourself. And there's so many boring fighters. I mean, listen, I get Floyd Mayweather is an insanely elite athlete and, and, and fighter, but he's the most boring dude to watch, especially the second half of his career. So as a guy who would fight wars in the ring, when you're broadcasting and you're watching some of these boring fights, how could you take it? Like, were you just like, oh my God, would you guys fight already? <laughs> you know, it's funny because uh, I felt like, um, I felt like, you know, I had the ability to see a lot of the nuances uh, in a fight that maybe a lot of people don't, you know, um, I felt like I've always had that, you know, um, even when I was younger, I would hear Larry Merchant complain about a slow paced fight. And I'd be like, does this guy not see why this is happening? You know, you have to explain to the audience why it's happening and how it could change and what each guy should be doing to make a change, not just throw punches. The guy in the first row with the beer in his hands to tell the guy to throw punches. You as an analyst, if you're all you can say is throw punches and fight, and you belong in the first row with the guy with the beer. You don't belong in that, at that, on, on that seat. You know what I'm saying? So, so while there are fights that fights at a slower pace and would be considered boring, you have to still have the explanation. You got to know what to say in those fights too. If you can't, if you just, if you just trash your sport, because some fights, unfortunately, styles make fights. Some fights are really exciting, and some fights are not. Once you're put on on a network, and you know the the, the network president, you know he tries to make the best fights he can, but sometimes the styles don't match, right? So, so it's up to the it's up to the, the broadcast team to do the best they can to make the network look good, you know, to, 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 you know, bring out what's going on in the fight. And if nothing is going on in the fight, then you've got to give a reason why this is happening. You know, these guys are in here fighting, but they're not fighting. Why is that? Well, stylistically, it's because this and this. One guy's a side pull, out pull one guy's a right-hander. You know, with it, one guy's clinching a lot. You know, if this guy would, would maybe step in with a left hook on, on underneath to the body before he sets it up this way, or maybe if this guy starts to faint and, and starts cutting off the ring this way, whatever it is, you've got to first acknowledge that the fight is slow-paced and then start to give little hints as to what each guy should be doing. And then hopefully guys start doing that. And if they're not, on explain why they're doing this instead of this and why it should be this. You know what I'm saying? There's so many ways you can go there. There's so many other, I've already described, you know, a bunch of different directions you can go there with that kind of a fight. So, and, 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 and all, it all applies and it might be difficult, but it's, it's your responsibility as the analyst to keep the audience gripped. You know, how many times have I seen a UFC fight where they're just laying on the ground for the whole five minutes, five minute round. And Joe Rogan is explaining like, yo, those guys 
look at how look at the little uh, underhook piece this guy get, gets here and whatever his explanation is a scientific explanation and you start to get gripped you start to be like oh man you know what i do see that you know and all of a sudden what you might consider a boring fight now you're all of a sudden you're following it on the ground you know uh when you might not have a have had a clue before though so you know, the naked eye, the layman may see a lot of things as boring, may not understand a lot of things. But if you give them the understanding, and as an analyst, that's your job. If you give them the understanding, you know, you you may make the uh, the viewership more 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 enthusiastic for them, more 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 uh, enjoyable for them. And that's your job. And and it also gives you gives you a chance to make the network look better for putting on the fight, because not every fight is going to be a blockbuster. And then of course, when there's a blockbuster, they speak for themselves. You do what you got to do. But not every fight's a blockbuster, so you got to know how to break things down one way or the other and, and you know that's kind of that's all i have to say about that like for example say <laughs> dude you just literally did an analysis on how to do analysis that was fucking awesome man <laughs> that like changed my whole perspective it's the way i see basketball which is because i played high school and college although not mm-hmm. at the level you were able to achieve in boxing but you see the things that other people don't and that's awesome dude what was your favorite fight that you called of all the fights what was the best one my favorite fight that I ever worked was uh, Anthony Joshua versus Vladimir Klitschko. Um, it was both the, it, I called it the Mayweather Pacquiao of Europe. You know, when I got there for that fight week to work it, the amount of hype, the amount of press, the amount of buzz in the air was comparable to the same buzz that I was in the air when I got to Vegas for Mayweather Pacquiao. It was just incredible what was going on. Uh, the, the buzz that was in the air in London that week. And then, um, to have had that, been a part of that buzz and been a part of that buildup, just like I was a part of Mayweather Pacquiao buildup um, and even Mayweather McGregor buildup. But the difference being the fight lived up to every expectation and then some. They, they put on a great show, a great fight in a front of a crowd with 80,000 people that you couldn't even hear yourself think it was that loud. And it was that loud the whole time. You know, there was that good of a fight. It was just awe-inspiring. I mean, it was just amazing. It was the most amazing uh, uh, it was the most amazing experience of, of my broadcasting career from even before the fight. The walkout to the fight was sick and then just sick. The introductions were sick, just crazy. I mean, I don't feel like my words will ever, will ever do it justice, you know. And then I thought as a broadcast team, we did a great job of calling the fight. And it was just when I, I, I rarely go back and watch fights that I worked because I'm sort of like Johnny Depp in that way. I don't want to overthink about what I'm doing, you know. I, so, but, but that fight was so good. I, when I got home from London, I put that, I, I put that baby on, man. I watched it like three different times. It was that good of a fight, you know, and it was that good of a show. So, for me, my favorite show I've ever worked is uh, Joshua Klitschko. Amazing. How do you think Tyson in his prime would have competed against the big heavyweights, the Tyson Furies, the Klitschko in his prime, Joshua's of the world? Because there was such a size differential. Yeah, I think uh, it's easy to get caught up in nostalgia. You know, everybody always wants to say that their time was always best. And I, I, I kind of, I'm kind of the same way. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll never say LeBron is better than Michael Jordan. You know, I'll, 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 I'm kind of the same thing, you know. So, it, you know, I, I just give you an example earlier. It's hard for me to say Brady's better than Montana, you know. So it's like, so it's the same, it's the same thing, you know. But so I, I'm kind of, uh, I'm kind of at fault for that too. But I do think Tyson was, an awesome fighter in his time. And especially being from Brooklyn, he was amazing for me, you know, and, and, and I remember how the buzz was in the air every time he was about to fight on that day, you know. It's different when you were looking at things in hindsight. But nobody, today's generation, now what I tell people is the difference when you live the generation is you don't know what it's like to wake up the morning of a Mike Tyson fight, you know. Right. I'll never know what it's like to wake up the morning of a Muhammad Ali fight. I Maybe this generation will know what it's like to make a, wake up the morning of a Mayweather fight or whatever. But to wake up the morning of a Tyson fight when you've been waiting for it, you know what I'm saying? And then it would last like a minute sometimes, you know what I mean? But it was just like, oh, this guy did it again. Wow. You know, like it was so it was something that that, that hit you. And, and I think the first 10 years of your life, the first 10 years of your life, you're very impressionable. You know, so I feel like and I'm in the, I'm in the generation that was most impressionable when Tyson was in his prime. You know, I'm born in 1980. And the first Tyson fight I remember uh, was Tyson Sphinx, you know? <clears throat> oh, so I can remember all the buzz for it and all that other stuff. And it was just like after that every single time, you know? So so I can remember those key moments and just waking up the morning of those fights is, whoa, whoa, this is crazy, you know? Like, and then the fights themselves. And, you know, you feel like, you know, when he's hitting Frank Bruno in the first fight with those uppercuts, you feel like, you feel like Bruno's head's going to just jump off his shoulders. At, at eight, nine years old, 
you you wouldn't be shocked. You know, just like this guy is so hard. Wow, you know, like this Bruno's gonna. You know he's gonna knock Bruno's head into the front into the front row. You know, like you you know you're just so impressionable. So I feel like we're kind of guilty of that. And then sometimes people in my generation will say, "Oh, Tyson would have beat any of these guys today." But you know, when I look back as an adult and I was an analyst, um, as much as I love Tyson, I do notice uh, that he was a little bit more ordinary against taller fighters. Um, you know, he went the distance with Bone Crusher. He went the distance with Tony Tucker. He lost to Buster Douglas. You know, it's natural. The heavyweight division. There's a lot of big guys. So I do think that he would have probably had a lot of trouble with some of these big guys, you know. Um, I'm not saying he wouldn't have beat them because, you know, if Tyson would have landed any of those shots, I mean, these guys are going, you know. Um, but somebody like Fury, for example, 6'9", he'll just lean on you. He's way too big. He's a foot taller than Tyson. I mean, it's, a, it's a massive difference. And he can fight. It's not like Jose Rebalta because I remember Jose Rebalta was, uh, was a tall guy. But, but Rebalta was not anywhere near the level of a Tyson Fury, you know. So, so it's interesting. But, but you know, you, you, you always think with Tyson, man, if he lands a shot, you don't know what this guy's going to think. You know what I'm saying? Is this guy going to stand up to it? You know? So, or if he stands up to it, is it going to change his thinking pattern for the rest of the fight? And he's going to become gun shy. And if he becomes gun shy, Tyson, he step on the gas and take it to him. You know, there is any fights. Sometimes the momentum of fights are changed. It doesn't have to get a knocker guy out. Sometimes you land a big shot. It doesn't end the fight, but it does change the way your opponent is going to think the rest of the night. You know what I'm saying? And, and that can change the momentum of that fight. So, Tyson had that kind of power. So you just don't know. You can never say for sure. I personally lean towards this the, on the end that he was probably going to be too small for some of these big guys, you know? And all, because all these big guys in today's generation, they're pretty strong. Some of them are very strong and they're very, very big. And Tyson never did really outstanding with taller, taller guys. But how am I going to just, you know, go tell you to bet the house on it? I would never tell you to go bet the house on it because this guy was knocking everybody out and, and their mothers too, you know? So, so it was, he was that kind of fighter and he, and he, and he brought that kind of explosiveness and, and, and attention to boxing. So, you know, I don't have a problem with anybody saying Tyson beats everybody. You know what I'm saying? Like, like, because, you know, I, I understand that love that, that, that infatuation with that, with the era and with Tyson himself. But, but I do think guys like Vladimir Klitschko because of that are also very underrated, you know, Vladimir Klitschko for me, you know, in his prime, you know, is in the conversation for the best heavyweight ever. You know what I'm saying? I don't care how boring he is. Boring, being boring and being effective don't necessarily go hand in hand. The effectiveness and excitement factor don't, don't have to go together. Sometimes they don't at all. And Mayweather, you brought it up with Mayweather. Mayweather is, is an example of that. You know, he's not the most exciting fighter, but he's the best fighter of this generation for sure. And he's in the conversation for the best ever. So Vladimir is the same thing. A lot of people don't appreciate Vladimir because, oh, he wasn't as exciting for them. Well, you know, it's not my fault. You don't understand the science of it. But at the end of the day, Vladimir was effective against everybody. And then you say, oh, well, he didn't, there was nobody he fought. That's because he, there were nobody because he was around. You know, people can become somebody if they're, if there's somebody who allows them to become somebody. But Vladimir was dominating the whole heavyweight division at that time. And there were some pretty good fighters. But, um, you know, everybody's era comes to an end. I think uh, today's era is a fun era as well. But um, I think you have to appreciate everybody. Not, not, and, and obviously, me being from Brooklyn, I appreciate Tyson tremendously. But looking at, looking at the whole spectrum of boxing now with the mindset that I have now, with the brain that I have now in boxing, it's much different than it was when I was a kid, right? Even before I started boxing. I think, um, you know, I gain appreciation for a lot of things that I didn't before. And I catch a lot of the nuances that I didn't before. And uh, it's really, really cool. Yeah, the thing with Tyson is there came a point when he stopped being just a boxer and the fame got a grip of him. And I'm not sure where that happened, but it's when he started making $100 million, you know. They... Yeah, of course. You know, Tyson was, you know, making even $30 million paydays in 1980. I mean, 1988. You know, it's $100 million today. Yeah, it's, it's $100 million. Yeah. You know? and, 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 and you're the most famous athlete on the planet, bigger than Michael Jordan at the time and Michael Jackson level. And they all want to hang out with you. When you're the heavyweight champion and you're on that level, those guys that, that are stars in everybody else's eyes, you're the star even to them. Even to them, you're the star. So, so it was, you know, yeah. And then to get there in, the, in your early 20s, you no, know, it's, it's a hard thing to keep up, of course. Yeah, and I think there comes a point where where – you see the early Tyson when he's training with Customato, and that guy was a machine of endurance and strength, and you can see every muscle rippling on him. And then there came that point where the drugs and the fame and all the other, and it just ate I him mean, up. I think, I think, I think ability-wise, Tyson still had it even after Cuss, but I do think psychologically, you know, he would have probably been stronger had Cuss been around. You know, I think Cuss kept him to, kept it together for Mike psychologically, you know, and emotionally, which is, I think, the way when the wheels fell off the wagon, I blame more of that because then 
once those wheels fall off the wagon, the physical wheels fall off the wagon as well, you know? But I think it, Tyson emotionally and psychologically uh, changed after D'Amato, uh, even though physically I think he was a dominant specimen for a while longer. I think if D'Amato was around, he would have kept Mike together uh, psychologically, Focus. Uh, emotionally. Focus, yeah. and maybe Tyson goes even further. Possibly. So I want to talk to you about Floyd Mayweather, Logan Paul. And I, I'm dying to hear your thoughts because I think you see boxing in such a, such a specific way. Do you think Floyd took it easy on him? Do you think Floyd was just out of shape? Do you think it was a size differential? What do you think happened there? I think I, I think it's a little bit of everything, you know. As a size differential, I think forty old. I think uh, Floyd is old. You know, he's in his forties. He's in his mid forties. I think um, Floyd wasn't fighting to, to kill him. I think Floyd was fighting to, you know, do do some work. And if he get him out of there, he would. But he wasn't gonna go over over the top to get him out of there. He never was even like that when he was in his prime. So he wasn't gonna become like that against a bigger guy outside of his prime. I think it was a uh, sort of a money grab. I think these TikTokers and and the YouTubers. I do think that while I think the Paul brothers have taken it a little bit more serious, I do think they're ruining the sport, uh, the image of the sport. I don't care that people say, oh, they, well, people, more people are watching boxing. No, they're not. The people that are watching these guys don't, don't know a fish hook, fish hook from a left hook. So they don't, they're not going to sit there and turn on. They're not going to order uh, uh, Fury versus Wilder next month. You know what I mean? The guys that the, a lot of the, most of the people that ordered Paul versus Mayweather are not going to order Fury versus Wilder next month, you know? So, you know, the, the people ordering Fury versus Wilder are the real boxing fans, you know? So so if, if you're going to tell me that the, the Logan Pauls and, and, and the YouTubers in general are, are are bringing in more boxing fans to boxing, more fans to boxing, then okay. But I, I'll bet all kinds of farmland with you that those people are not ordering the, the main boxing pay-per-view. They're not, you know? And they're just ordering the YouTube pay-per-views. They'll, they'll order the TikTokers versus Instagrammers or whatever they did, or TikTokers versus YouTubers that's coming up soon. They'll order uh, Logan versus Floyd. You know, they'll order Jake versus uh, uh, Aspirin, you know, uh, uh, they'll order those kind of things, but they won't order the main pay-per-views. Now, if you told me that they were becoming boxing fans, they were coming to support the sport and started to order other pay-per-views, I'd say, you know what, lovely, but they're not. So I don't look at it that way. They do have a right to make their money, I guess, because, you know, in a capitalist world, if you generate money, you know, you can, it's your right to earn that money because if you're the one who generates it, that's fine. But at the end of the day, I, I do have an issue with people going up to an average person today and telling them so if you ask an average person today an average millennial today or a generation z or whatever they call these young mutts today whatever uh what, what you i'll give you the word boxing giving the first person that comes to your your mind it's supposed to be canelo or anthony joshua deontay wilder tyson fury it's uh, uh terence crawford uh you know it's supposed to be one one of these people but instead it's going to be logan or jake paul to a lot of people you know what i mean so when you're starting to become the image of the sport to people's minds, as opposed to the real championship level fighters, is supposed to be the image of the sport. For me, that starts to bother me, you know, because it, you're giving the it's giving the sport the wrong impression, you know. So I'd like to, you know, just kind of do away with these guys, but they're 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 getting in there. And I had a guy start a fight with me, start an argument with me. You know what I'm saying? So so you know they're 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 moseying their way in there. But you know, I'd love to I'd love to, you know. Grab one of these. It's funny. I, I got a chance to grab one of these guys. Maybe I, I might just grab one of these guys. You know what I mean? After the beat that I just had, I, I'm, I'm tempted to, but I don't want to fall into that into that rut like everybody else, right? So I could beat this guy with one hand. Like maybe what happens if I beat this guy with one hand? I would bet this guy, this Corey B, this guy Corey B. I would bet him. I'll let you tie my right hand behind my back. I'll fight you with one hand, okay? If I can beat you, if I beat you, you you have to announce to all the YouTubers and TikTokers they got to get out of boxing. You are the representative. If you beat me, even with my one hand and my right hand tied behind my back, if you beat me, I will walk away from the entire business of boxing, commentating, fighting, everything. I'll do that. I'll, I'll, I'll go to that point. If it means eliminating this TikTok, YouTube, Instagram generation out of the sport and just allowing, allowing the sport to grow naturally uh, with championship level fighters, I would do that. That I would do. You know what I mean? I would do it with pleasure. But, you know, I don't know. You know, it's it's crazy. But, you know, it, it, it does get annoying and it gets more annoying because now they're they're just forcing themselves in there completely. You know, now it's like anybody with a following, anybody, you got a couple of followers, you just do a fight. That's all it is. It's crazy, bro. It's mind boggling. And people are going to watch. People are going to watch. It's wild. It's amazing because I was going to segue to what you just brought up, the incident you had with the, with that Corey B kid. And here's the thing, as a 43-year-old man, you spent the bulk of your life at a craft. 
you could probably in any situation beat the living shit out of anybody in front of you. But this kid who probably wouldn't last two seconds with you is going to do something like that. And I'm like, this is the world we live in right now. Like, like, he wouldn't last two seconds even if I got one hand. If I got one hand, I'm serious. I even gave McGregor this offer. It still stands, by the way. McGregor, could stay, the offer still stands. And we do a money winner takes all. He's never going to take it because McGregor will never find me winner takes all because he knows he'd be fine for free. But nonetheless, nonetheless, you know, I'll do it with this guy. I, I, if it means eliminating the TikTokers and Instagrammers and YouTubers, I would do it. Because it would have to do, be in some sort of way where it would, it would, it would, pique my interest it can't just be i box you yeah you know what you smack me in the head you know because i know what you're doing you were you were cloud chasing with that you know so so but you know what if i if you make it interesting you know what let's make it interesting because otherwise i'll i'll completely light you up if i got both hands it's not even fair to you i'll assault you and i'll look like the bad guy even though this guy started it i'll look like the bad guy so why would i do that to myself instead i'll say you know what tie my right hand behind my back well i'll use one hand and I'll, 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 I'll look like Roy Jones and I'll fight you. I'll repeat four, five, six hooks in a row on you. And you won't know where to go. You won't know where to go. Jabs and hooks. You won't know where to go. I mean, I basically won my law ball fight like that one hand because I broke my right hand. I mean, they didn't want to give it to me. But I'm, I, I'd be professional fighters. I, you know, I fought and be professional fighters with one hand. I would stop this guy, even one hand. You can put the, the glove, the size gloves you want to put on us. I mean, that's the only way this is going to stop is if you start to embarrass them. You know what I mean? Because they think it's like a joke. They think you play boxing. You don't play boxing. You do boxing. So it's not a sport. It's not a game. So if it, it, unless these guys start to get embarrassed, it, it's going to keep continuing. It's going to keep continuing, unfortunately. So that's my question. Because with Floyd, even with the size difference, I thought to myself, and even at the advanced stage, even if he's not in elite shape, the skill level, he could target and hit anybody he wants anytime, anywhere. And I was watching that. And I thought to myself, is he laying back? Is he just doing this for entertainment? Does he just not want to open himself up? I couldn't figure it out. Or was he thinking, hey, if I let this go longer, it'll create anticipation for a rematch or I can fight his brother. And he's smart enough to think that way. But I couldn't figure out what was going on. Because I'm like, shouldn't Floyd just kill anybody in front of him if he really wants to? Yeah, I, I think... Uh... I think it's a combination of everything you said. I wouldn't be surprised if they were angling towards him fighting his brother next. Um, I also don't think there was enough anger there. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, they're not, he probably doesn't care about representing the sport anymore. He's kind of representing just himself, you know? I feel like it's, it's, it should be on guys like us' his shoulders to represent the sport when it comes to this kind of thing. Because if these guys have the guts to actually get in there and box and go in there against boxers, at least Jake is smart enough to not fight boxers, you know? He's smart enough to keep stay away from all the, all the boxers. And he's fighting NBA guys. Uh, he's, he's using MMA guys as punching bags. You know, he's, he's doing all that, which is, okay, that's smart. But nonetheless, you know, you're starting to get guys that are now jumping in with boxers. You know, you got to make that statement. As the boxer, you got to make that statement. You don't just treat it like it's a... It's a joke or a game. You got to actually make an example out of this guy so that this never happens again. And I feel like if you make too much of an example, you might kill somebody. So that's why I said, you know what? In my case, I'll let you tie my hand behind my back. I really would. I, if I would let you tie my hand behind my back and I do it one hand and I would use hooks and jigs. And I'm telling you, he wouldn't go the distance. So they announced today that De La Hoya, Oscar De La Hoya, is going to be fighting Vitor Belfort, the MMA great. What are your thoughts on that? What do you think? Um, you know what? I think, I think, I think Oscar sees this whole uh, retirement um, circle going, this whole retirement tour going. Um, Mayweather's doing it. Uh, Chavez Sr. is doing it with Hector Camacho Jr. Um, so Oscar's like, you know what? Let me jump in on this too. You know, why not? Right. So, so I feel like, uh, I feel like it's becoming a thing. I, these retirement tours, you know what it is with with the advance of YouTube and Instagram and, and, and all this other stuff? People see these fighters in their prime and they all, they're always curious. You know, Mike Tyson did it too. You know, everybody has this legendary figure in their mind, but they never woke up the morning of one of their fights. Like I said before, you never woke up to a morning when Oscar the lawyer fight if you're young. You never woke up the morning of a Tyson fight if you're young. Or you get to, they kind of give you a taste of it and you kind of get suckered into buying it, you know? I don't mind if it happens here and there. I just don't want it to start taking over the whole sport because then it's going to take away from from the guys in their primes. You know, I, I do think there's a, there is a, I do think there is a, a niche for this, but that niche shouldn't be taken over the main part of the sport. So we'll see, we'll see what happens. 
All right, let's transition to bare knuckle. You obviously tried it. You're now commentating on it. Let me give you the plug here because you have an event coming up. Hold on. Let me pull this sucker up. Hold on. Make sure I get this right. Hold on. I clicked it off and uh, all right, here it is. You have BYB, Six Extreme Bare Knuckle. You're part of the broadcast team, July 16th. I want to talk to you about Bare Knuckle, everything that's going on. I think it's fucking exciting as hell. Tell me your thoughts. I think it's exciting as hell. Um, and I think it's, it's it gets you the result you want fast, right? Um, shorter fights, a lot of blood right away. They end pretty quickly too, you know? Um, I think it's a, it's a double positive because it gives the impression that it's more violent. But in reality... It's not more violent. You're not getting the uh, extreme trauma to your brain. Guys can't load up punches the same way when they're bare knuckle because their hands are going to start hurting. So while in professional boxing, you have just enough padding to protect your hands, but not, not enough padding to protect your opponent. So therefore exposing your opponent to damage. And that's why guys get traumatic brain injuries. In bare knuckle boxing, if you start throwing punches that hard, like you're doing in professional boxing, as consistently as you do in professional boxing, you're going to hurt, uh, hurt your hands. So you, it's got to be a little bit more accuracy, a little bit more uh, uh, shot placement. And, and sharpness, you know? But the positive is, for the fans anyway, you're gonna see a lot more blood because a, a, a knuckle bear, an exposed knuckle, even if it grazes you, it's gonna rip the skin open, right? So people have this impression like it's more violent, so it sells. It is more uh, appealing to the eye as far as if you're looking for that violent, if you're looking for that uh, uh, violent thirst to you um, to, as a fan, and the fights are shorter and quicker. So this is the, this is the again, this is a, uh, this is a mutt generation we live in. I said it before, I'll say it again. You know, they need instant gratification. They're not capable of, of thinking uh, uh, and letting something play out. This is why they need their, their smartphones. They need their, uh, their uh, instant whatever they need. You know, their, their apps right away. They don't want to even channel surf. I got me, I, I miss channel surf. You know what I mean? I like not, I like not knowing what I was going to watch on TV, turn on the TV and flip through the channels and finding something cool. You know what I'm saying? Like it's a, it's a surprise. Now they want to know what they're going to watch before they lay down. They want to, they want to lay down, put on their app, and go exactly where they're going to go. Like, I don't know. For me, the instant gratification doesn't make sense. From, this is a different kind of generation. So bare knuckle is perfect for them because it gets you there right away. There's no feel-out process. There's no, um, there's no you know, stylistic matchups. You're just going in there, especially with BYB with the Trigon. This three, it's the smallest ring in – or it's the smallest combat surface in professional combat sports. You basically take a step back. You're in one of the three corners, bro. And if you wind up in one of the three corners, you got no way out. You know what I mean? Like, because it's bare knuckle. And the triangle is not like a, a, a square ring where so you can glide on the ropes. The triangle, the ropes keep, close you in. So you're closed in with the, in that corner. And, and there's a guy in front of you. Now what are you going to do? You know, so you don't even have a chance for ring generalship. You got to get started right away. You got to fight. So it's the gratification to another level, even more so than any other uh, bare knuckle promotion, you know, uh, so for me, when I worked the BYB show, I'm like, wow. I was like, this is instant action, instant finishes, and on to the next fight. I mean, it is crazy, you know? And if it's not an instant finish, it's going to be a wildly, wildly violent fight. Um, but like I said, the good news is no traumatic brain injuries. Guys are going home. Guys are, guys are going to be lumped up, stitched up, uh, busted up, but they're going home to their families afterwards. What's the toughest fight you ever had? Uh, the toughest fight I ever had was the Miguel Cotto fight. Um, long fight. Uh, uh, a lot of damage taken um, in a fight where I needed to be competitive to prove that I was at that level. Um, and it was, uh, and, and fortunately for myself, I was able to be competitive enough to where, you know, people kind of brought me back, you know, uh, what gets lost in that fight is because I broke the orbit when I had so much swelling, what gets lost in that fight is that I did almost win it. You know, I, I won four or five rounds in the fight, you know, <laughs> but you know, the, the damage I took in the fight uh, kind of supersedes that. And people are like, Oh, they just think about the toughness and, uh, and the oh, Polish toughness was another level. And I'm, of course I'm, I, I'll be the first one to admit that it had to be really tough. They had, I had to be really tough that night and I had to really bite down that night and prove who I was. Otherwise I knew I wasn't coming back to that level and I needed to stay on that level. I needed to make that living for myself, you know? So it's, uh, the fight was a blessing despite the, the, the tough, the, the, the tough night that it was. And, uh, for that, I have, uh, you know, uh, I owe Miguel Cotto a lot, you know, and he probably doesn't even know, you know, uh, it, it, the, the fight changed my life and he was definitely the best fighter ever fought and the toughest. I want to ask you about that because you, you always hear with fighters, they always have that one fight where you take a ton of damage and you'll hear the term, they're never the same after that. Is that true? When you take, when you have a night where you just take that type of pounding, does it really affect you long-term and you're just different after it? I think if you take too many of those, yeah. Um, I think if you're young enough, you might, you might still be able to recover. Um, 
But then again, it's not always the case even when you're young. Meldrick Taylor was only 23 when he fought Julio Cesar Chavez, but he really wasn't the same again after the Julio Cesar Chavez fight, you know, uh, in an amazing fight they had. So, um, you know, I, I guess it could apply to some things. I think there was a time in my career where I wasn't the same anymore after the tough fights, but I, it was not a Dakota fight. I was still fresh enough. It's possible that me fight, me starting boxing late still had enough. I still had enough freshness to be able to be in that kind of fight and remain fresh afterwards. But uh, because I started, I didn't start boxing until I was 16. I didn't have my first amateur fight until I was 17. So I was still pretty fresh uh, when I fought Kodo at 25. But I don't know. I guess everybody's body's different. Everybody's brain is different and reacts differently. Um, I do understand that some guys aren't the same. Again, I, at a certain point, that did happen to me. But not after that fight. Dude, this was awesome. You got such an electric personality. And hearing your analysis was amazing. Thank you for taking the time. Again, BYB 6 Extreme, July 16th. You're going to be broadcasting. I think Bare Knuckles awesome. I hope they eventually you're back in boxing because you make boxing better. And just honestly, seeing you unfiltered like this, I want to see that type of voice back in boxing, man. Because boxing is such a great sport, especially when it's great fights, man. And I hope they somehow you're like back in that as well. Yeah, yeah. you never know, man. But, uh, uh, I, I'll, I look forward to working on the BYB show next month. It's uh, it's an exciting form of combat sports. Everybody look into it. BYB, bare knuckle boxing. Um, you won't be disappointed. Extreme, extreme knockouts. Um, and the trigon forces that. And uh, if you don't know what the trigon is, just look it up. It's a small ring, triangles, triangle shaped. And uh, guys do get knocked out. Every single fight on the card I worked was ended in a knockout. That's how crazy it is. Before I let you go, will we see you either in the trigon or a ring again? Uh, <laughs> I, I don't think you'll see me in the Trigon, man. I, I don't know if I'm, my body can handle that kind of fight anymore. But, but um, I, I, I don't know. You know, uh, it, it depends how much Corey B gets on my nerves. You know, if he continues to get on my nerves, he might get what he wants. He thinks he, you know, his, his mouth is, is slowly going to sign a check. His ass can't cash. We'll see if, uh, if he gets me to that point. Right now, I'd say no. But this guy gets on my nerves more and more every day. And um, I don't just, if I end up just hurting him really badly, I'm going to look like a bad guy. So I got to more so do it in an embarrassing way. That's why I said the one hand thing. As of now, it's no. But if this guy keeps getting on my nerves, either I'm going to go find him at his radio station and smack him around, or I might just, you know, agree to do a one hand just so I can embarrass him in front of the whole world and, and uh, end this whole YouTube TikToks thing once and for all. Dude, this was awesome. Thanks so much. This was a fun hour, Paulie. Thanks, Thanks man. man.